So welcome everyone to today's webinar. It looks like we've got a great group that's joining us today. And we know this is a topic that is on every fundraiser's mind. Who will give right now? So we're looking forward to hopefully providing you with some insights and strategies to help you answer that question for your organization as we move through a crisis that looks like it's gonna be around for some time to come. So thanks for joining us. Uh, a few housekeeping items as we get started. Uh, if you, hopefully by now you're becoming real Zoom aficionados, uh, take a look at the lower uh, bar on your screen. You'll see a Q&A box. Please, please submit questions. We really want this to be as interactive and engaging as possible. And uh, secondly, if you have any uh, issues at all or questions, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email, kimcogswell at pursuant.com. I'll do what I can to help. Um, but we look forward to having a, a great time together. So just to kind of orient ourselves, this is the first in a series of three webinars that we're hosting during the month of July. And uh, the series is on the art and science of major giving. Uh, coming up our webinars two and three, hopefully you've had a chance to register for those. If not, and you like what you hear today, please join us next week and the following week. And we'll look forward to continuing the dialogue. We've got some great stuff and some great speakers planned. So just by way of introduction, uh, first about Pursuant, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the company, uh, we are all about helping you identify and engage your supporters more personally to build rewarding and long-term relationships. And, and the way we do that uh, starts with the data and our giving DNA technology platform and the augmented intelligence that it can provide. So you might say that we, we start with the data geek side of our house. And, and then there's our people, um, subject matter experts, strategists, most all of them fundraisers themselves who have been in your shoes. I am Kim Cogswell. I'm Director of Technology Solutions here at Pursuant. I've been uh, working with our technology for over 11 years now. So I've been around for a while and I'm excited to be here today with my colleague, Kristen. Thank you, Kim. Um, I'm, my name is Kristen Priest, as Kim said. I'm the Vice President of Client Strategy. Uh, I'm a former major gift officer, primarily in higher ed, spent about um, 20 years of my life um, working primarily in the major gift space and campaigns. Uh, I got my master's degree in philanthropic studies from Indiana uh, School of Philanthropy with an emphasis on understanding the factors in high performing major giving programs. Um, and most recently and most importantly, now uh, for the last six years, I've had the privilege of partnering with our clients here at Pursuant as campaign counsel, building major gift strategy, um, and as coach for gift officers and major gifts um, team leaders. Thanks, Kristen. Mm -hmm. So over the next hour, um, this is our agenda for the day. Uh, we want to take a look back. We are certainly living and fundraising in unprecedented times, um, but I think there's some value in um, seeing what lessons we can apply um, from previous experiences to, to today. Uh, and as we think about who will give now, I think we also need to understand how our opportunities may have shifted uh, and what donors may rise to the forefront not in spite of, but because of the challenges we are facing as organizations, as a country, and as a world right now. Um, we want to look at those factors determining who will give, and um, in particular, who will give right now? How do I identify um, those individuals? Um, and then applying all of those, how do we look at segmentation 
um, within our database, within our major donors to understand the opportunities and the factors that will determine who will give and um, how do we efficiently develop the right strategies to connect with those folks. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Um, there's this little thing called the coronavirus going on that is radically changing how we can connect with major donors and perhaps changing who those top prospects might be. Um, if you're like me, at least early on in the crisis, I had to constantly remind myself to balance best practice with sensitivity to the very real challenges um, and very real opportunities uh, to not give major gifts whiplash um, by seeking to daily recreate major gift strategies based on what I heard in the news this morning um, and what was happening in the economy. So over the course of this presentation, we're gonna seek to balance this to within the context of best practice, share some of what we're discovering about who will invest um, and who will invest in meaningful ways in 2020. Now, as with those daily COVID updates I shared, it seems like the specific numbers are changing daily. Um, but I think by most indicators we're looking at, uh, 2020 has been less than ideal for, econ for the economy, or at least 2020 events can make folks feel uncertain about the future. Um, the most recent job numbers showed employment at just over 11%. Um, we know acquisition traditionally declines in recessions, um, and we're now in one. And some of those early indicators we're get, getting from giving uh, in 2020 also have us pausing for a moment. Um, data from AFP's Fundraising Effectiveness Project uh, looked at giving for Q1 um, and shows some of those early indicators and the impact of COVID. In Q1 of 2020, we saw a decrease of just over 5% in donors. Uh, we also saw a decrease in total dollars. But there is some positive news in that. We saw an increase of almost 6% in gifts under $250. Now, we might be saying, why is that last point something we should be overly excited about in a universe where we're thinking about major gifts? Well, there's some unique characteristics around those COVID donors. Um, those donors who are either new to an organization or a reacquisition, they're giving in more meaningful ways. Um, they're younger, at least half of them are younger than 55. They have the same rate of affluence as our older major giving total file, um, and they're digital. And part of why that's attractive to us is those who prefer to give digitally we see they're faster transactors. They more quickly um, build relationships with the organization. So what this means is that if we can engage and keep these donors, we have a strong opportunity for high lifetime value for these individuals, um, as well as building and identifying a major donor pipeline um, for, for five and 10 years from now. And I know while in the midst of this crisis, it can be challenging, um, to think that far out. I think there is opportunity, and this is one of those within 2020 that I think we would be uh, remiss as organizations um, if we don't just pause um, and, and do a, a bit of a dive uh, into the data behind our new customers to see um, who, if stewarded properly, uh, might quickly grow into at least a lower tier major donor. Um, which is really just leads us to this. This is one of my favorite sayings, and I think it's so true right now in 2020. The sky isn't falling, but the major gifts ground beneath us is shifting. And that shift is what we're going to talk about today. Our ability to understand our major donors and prospective major donors, where they're at right now, um, their needs for empathy and understanding, and their desire to impact change and feel some sort of sense of power or influence for good in critical situations they're experiencing. Um, and even for those major donors who may not step up and give immediately, 
Uh, what we've seen in previous economic downturns, times of crisis, or even regional disasters is something that's important for us to remember. We will see a quick uptick in giving, often from new donors, which is what we're experiencing right now in coronavirus, um, a sustained lull, and then a resurgence to a new high level of giving that's driven by our major donors. And if they're your major donors, they're likely significant donors to other organizations as well, um, which means other organizations are also having conversations with these donors. And we need to be sure that our relationship with these donors is such um, that we can have respectfully identified um, what needs to be true for them um, to be ready to engage in a major gifts conversation, meaning um, whether the COVID pandemic is over or we have a vaccine or the economy, something happens in the economy, um, what needs to be true in that donor's universe or what needs to be true for us as an organization for that donor to be ready to have a conversation about making a meaningful investment. Um, because what we find more often than not is those donors are ready to have the conversation sooner than we think they are. Um, and too often we as gift officers, we as um, prospect researchers uh, delay the process more than the donor. So let's take a look specifically at major giving in times of crisis. Um, so what are those COVID major gift challenges we're experiencing? Uh, as state by state, we're experiencing full or partial closures. Um, many, if not all of your donors are, I'm guessing, are likely shying away from our tried and true face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, and it can be uncomfortable or sometimes even feel disrespectful when that's how we're used to having those conversations, when we can no longer sit in a living room with our most significant supporters um, to invite them to give. Uh, and by the way, if you're in this boat, quick commercial break, uh, definitely join us for the next couple webinars Kim mentioned as we're going to be diving into how some organizations are doing this successfully. Um, if you're a major gift officer, if you lead major gifts teams, if you're a prospect researcher wanting to support those gift officers, um, definitely join. We'll be we're going to be sharing some, some concrete examples of um, how organizations are getting um, creative and experiencing some success. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. This might be a good time to just ask the audience, very informal poll, but maybe to raise their hands if, if they have either experienced this themselves or uh, seen it on their team that that the that gift officers have have struggled to uh, make the transition. I'd love to see a show of hands and I I see many coming in now. Okay, oh yeah. Um, I would I would say that um, uh, I would say of us us yeah, many, many, many. I would say at least a third of our participants are, are experiencing exactly what you've described. Makes sense. Um, and this is actually a great time. I want to address it. We got a couple questions that came in. Um, one says, uh, Josh asks, when you say the overall dollars have decreased by 6% in 2020, that's coming from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. It's out of AFP. I happen to sit on the Research Council. So I um, had a chance to look at that data uh, several weeks ago, but I believe it is published now. Um, and so a quick Google search, or if you're an AFP member, you should be able to get the full report. Um, so another challenge, active solic solicitations may require some reconsideration. And I use that language really intentionally. Um, it, both the emphasis on, again, too often we just um, get a little bit overly anxious and hit pause across the board um, and reconsideration. It's not necessarily a reduction or a change, but to simply think about is this gift structure, is the payment structure we have in place, is the specifics around what they might want to fund, um, is this still most relevant to where they're interested and where is, we as an organization um, have committed to fund. Um, multi-year pledges may be at risk. Um, someone who made a commitment a year or two ago 
may feel uncertain about their ability to complete, especially a multi-year if they're five-year pledges, those longer pledges, um, to just simply engage and have those close conversations with your donors. Um, and this is another, this speaks to a question that we received that says, um, for groups that have thought about launching a multi-year campaign pre-COVID, what do you recommend? Holding until the dust settles, forging ahead. So there's no one correct answer. We're seeing several different things. And I think as long as the, um, the decision is reached based in strategy and conversation with leadership, um, each one of these is a great option. Um, for some, if they are in the very early planning stage, they may hit pause on the big exhaustive capital campaigns. Um, the planning is still happening, but the big celebration and launch, um, they're pushing out six months to 18 months. Um, where it's a comprehensive campaign, we often think, especially higher ed, healthcare, those large organizations, we need that big, loud, exciting number around a campaign. And we're finding the opposite is playing well, where in those comprehensive campaigns, we actually uncouple all of those components and we create targeted, focused, project-based or specific initiative campaigns. Um, and for others, uh, if they're mid uh, campaign, they are either extending that timeline, pushing it out an additional year or revising the goals within if they haven't yet gone public and just changing um, that number and um, either cutting back on some of the programming and so the funding needs aren't there or determining that there's another path through which they're going to do that. So um, it's a conversation often in terms, in, in um, part with um, chief leadership of the organization, um, any revision to a strategic plan and conversations with finance, um, as well as some of those key stakeholders within your organization. Some good news uh, from Mark, who shared on the Q&A that um, they just completed a $200 million capital campaign at UNC Charlotte. And he said uh, they raised just under $220 million, including an $8.4 million gift in June. So that's a, that's, I, I love the uh, $8.4 million gift in June. That's really encouraging to anyone who's, um, you know, felt awkward about making an ask. Um, kudos to you, Mark, and the team. I, I think you're lucky to have uh, been on the tail end of your campaign. Uh, and I've, I'm hearing that from others as well. Uh, other, uh, others that we work with that they, they've um, met their campaign and, and even exceeded it. I think Kristen has addressed that challenge of moving forward now in the new reality. Excellent, great points, Kim. Um, and by the way, I see a lot of questions coming through. We're going to try to answer as many as we can throughout the presentation. Um, if we don't get to yours, we may try to reach out afterwards um, or just connect with us. We'd love to con continue the dialogue. So if we don't get to your question in the next hour, um, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, so let's also look at major donor behavior during downturns. And so here's, I think, where there's some important context for us to remember. Um, what we see more often is that there is a selective reduction in giving rather than even giving across the board. So a major donor that may give meaningfully to seven or eight organizations in an economic downturn, um, they will instead give to fewer organizations and try to maintain that highest possible level of support. And in fact, even up their giving for those organizations they're most passionate about to ensure that organization is able to remain vibrant and relevant um, during an economic challenge. We find they re-engage with organizations, those major donors, the ones that may be near the bottom of our portfolio because as a major gift officer, we think, man, that Kim Cogswell, she just, she doesn't seem excited and passionate around these initiatives. Um, but as our 2020 world is changing um, and some of how you may be responding to these crises may be changing, some of how this donor's world may be changing in ways that are bringing them back to what you do in your mission. And we find major donors re-engage. They may not re-engage at that highest transformational level, um, but they present us with an opportunity. They kind of raise their hand, if you will, to say, let's, um, let's talk about a bigger conversation. Um, they give through different ways. 
Um, someone who may prefer historically to have made an outright giving. Um, if they have our donor advised fund donors um, can become incredibly important in helping us sustain um, through a crisis. They're the ones who, well, if their funds are connected to um, stocks or they may see some dips in, in the size of that fund, it's money that they've already set aside and they feel more comfortable giving them and, and giving now um, out of those donor advised funds whereas others may be a little bit more cautious and want to, to ride out another month or two, see what's happening around the economy um, or give through a more prolonged payment schedule. Um, and finally, it's just important to remember that major donor giving is more stable than economic indicators. We think about the last recession um, when um, economic indicators like the S&P just tanked, um, but giving dropped at a fraction of this pace. And so as we have any value to this um, may or may not happen in our future. It's just important to remember that you look at regional um, and national um, trends show uh, generosity holds much more stable. So with all this in mind, uh, how do we navigate through these challenges to understand our 2020 opportunities? I think there's some value in taking a step back and looking at why major donors give. Um, there's some research by Shervish um, conducted, goodness, nearly probably 20 years ago around donor motives. Additional studies have been done specifically looking at high net worth individuals and why they give in times of crisis. So I wanna pull out a few of those um, points that have um, come most to the forefront around major donor giving in times of crisis, those motives. And as we think about messaging to our donors, I think this is an important um, place to, to pause. Um, to affect change, more than volunteering, running for office, any other form of civic engagement, their generosity is how high net worth individuals feel they can have the greatest impact in the, of, in the world. Um, and in times of crisis, major donors will reach deep to affect the desired change. Um, so of what I have, um, if I have my health, if I have health insurance, um, I still have my job. We have um, on a much more gut level, um, a sense of awareness and a desire to, to express gratitude. This desire for connection. So uh, with social and physical distancing and moving to remote work, so many of us are now just craving connection. I, I like to say, you know, it's bad when the introverts like me uh, want to get out and see people. Um, and so this connection, um, they want to be tied to your brand and peer major donors. How we might typically think about building connection can take additional importance. How do we create community within and among your major donors? Uh, express us who they want to be. Um, as you are relevant, serving, and a part of speaking into the 2020 challenges, whether you're a hospital, a university, um, or a fine arts organization, um, those values, what you bring, um, allows them to connect with how they want to be seen as a part of solving for and reacting to what we're experiencing in 2020. Uh, and finally, this sometimes seems a little silly, but we know from science and multiple studies, the act of giving makes us feel good. Uh, when we create opportunities for major donors to affect change, express gratitude, experience connection, and express how they want to see themselves at their very best. Um, when we do that, we give them the space for joy, which unfortunately can feel in short supply this year. Um, and why major donors don't give um, in crises? Uh, in addition to um, potential economic barriers, um, there are others that um, were, were given as just a strong reasoning um, for not giving. We didn't really ask. And this is a pitfall we're particularly susceptible in times of potential financial challenges. Um, it's important that assuming we've had the respectful discussion that includes um, securing their permission to continue the conversation, 
we're transparent and clear right now regarding opportunity and need. Um, we ask too little of them. We talked about major donor behavior and their tendency to reduce the number of organizations rather than reduction across the board. And when we ask for token gifts without getting feedback from the donor that they need to reduce their giving, uh, the perception is that they don't really need support or at least they don't really need me, the donor. Your major donor wants to own the solution, um, own being a part of ensuring your organization is vibrant. And we take that away from them when we uh, reduce the giving uh, peremptorily. Um, we forgot the Wi-Fi. We uh, tap into any of our uh, sales training. Um, the what's in it for you. Uh, just a quick reminder to identify and frame giving around the context of what's in it for them. Um, and remember often the most meaningful be benefit is intangible, um, but we just need to think about that as well. And finally, we didn't identify their case for support. We all have that official case for support and that's an incredibly important document, um, but perhaps more important when we have our conversations with major donors, um, more important than sharing the case for support is identifying their case for support. Why do they partner with us? Um, why do they identify? Um, why is part of their identity wrapped in who we are? And we talked a little bit, I'd like to unpack that. The, the case for support, their case for support. Um, now, those 2020 cases for support, at the beginning of the year, we thought our case for support would be shipped fairly, I call it shelf stable. Um, by March, we thought, my goodness, this global pandemic is what will just um, rattle our country. And now we have um, new issues that are emerging, social justice. And I think in any election year, while the first two will likely drive a significant part of the election year conversation, um, based on your organization and your mission, additional um, priorities or issues may bubble to the surface during an election year. Now, you may decide you don't wish as an organization, it's not appropriate to be at the center of any of these issues, um, but I think it's an important to, discussion to have in, as an organization. Um, and this does not have to be how you are solving for this issue, but rather it answers th this question. Why in light of what we're experiencing around us, are you and your mission more relevant than ever? And um, for a global pandemic, we may think medical research, hospitals, um, community service, jobs, unemployment, obvious um, case for support related to the global pandemic, um, but even groups like uh, fine arts performance um, and their shift to free virtual concerts to simply provide um, moments of levity um, to provide free concerts to patients and, and um, to support the frontline workers. So. Um, how is what you're doing relevant to and meeting the needs of a world facing a global pandemic? And really what that leads to is thinking about what new funding and donor opportunities exist as a result of 2020. Um, this is not to say we should have the tail wag the dog or that we are completely shifting who we are as an organization, those initiatives and places where we're going to focus but rather how do we frame what we do in light of what our country and world is experiencing in 2020? Also again, be able to identify um, donors um, who may be excited to renew their relationship with us or strengthen that. Um, here's a, a great example I like to share um, is a, I'm working with a, a client who um, broadcasts uh, quite a bit of their programming and they, had, uh, they were struggling with some technology. They needed hundreds of thousands of dollars in tech upgrades. And it's one of those funding initiatives that you know, they needed new webcams, they needed new computers, um, that they kind of buried within the operational budget because it just wasn't exciting. It just wasn't sexy to who they were. Um, as more and more people were forced to live virtually and online, um, they identified this as both a more critical mission delivery need, 
um, and also something people could get excited about. And within a few weeks, um, they secured several hundred thousands of dollars um, to allow them to upgrade their systems to meet the needs of a country um, wrestling with um, isolation, loneliness, and a global pandemic that has many of us sheltering in place. So before I pick it up from here, uh, Kristen, a, a little bit of a technology issue, and I, it, I'm, it makes me very sad that some people are having experiencing your voice cutting in and out. I've had several over the Q&A. Um, so I'm wondering if, as I continue to move through the next few slides, if you have a, another way of dialing in. Let me, yeah, while you do that, let me try something else. Again, my, my apologies. One of the joys of working from home is you are not, um, you don't have that office uh, bandwidth. I am I'm reliant on the home internet. So let me try calling in from my phone to see if that works. Uh, but again, if that's just not solving the problem for you all, again, my apologies, but we should have a recording that should have this a little bit cleaner for you. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you all for your patience. So Kristen has done a great job of laying out some of uh, the challenges we face, the, the uh, need now more than ever to understand donor behavior, how donor behavior can shift in times like these, and uh, better understanding, you know, we know that there are donors out there who love our mission and are ready to step up and give. Who are those donors who will give right now? And the best way to answer this question is to dig into the data. So where do we start? The fundraising school at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, describes or uses something they call an LIA score which stands for linkage, interest, and ability. So linkage, what kinds of existing relationships might exist with potential donors to our organization that we can take advantage of? What kind of interest might these prospective donors have in our, in our mission? And what kind of ability do they have to support it? And what we've done is we've taken that concept and we've boiled it down to attachment and capacity. And uh, if you've attended any of our previous uh, webinars or read any of our work, we're, we're, we use these terms often. Attachment is all about how close does a donor feel to our organization? How engaged are they? Basically, what is their inclination? What might their inclination to support us be if they have the capacity to do so? And where these these two circles intersect is where our major donor prospects live. Those are the best uh, possibilities for major gifts. But the 2020 crisis has presented us with some, a, a really interesting, what we're calling a, a third ring in, in, in this uh, nice little relationship here. So in addition to attachment and capacity, we've got this 2020 impact, COVID, social justice issues, and uh, upcoming presidential election with a lot of uncertainty on the horizon. And we'd like to uh, challenge your thinking, as I think Kristen has already done so well. Yes, there's negative impact of all of this, but where might the opportunities be for us that we can take advantage of? And how do we call them out? And what we're seeing is that, as Kristen explained, folks who have capacity um, in light of the 2020 impact are, are stepping up. For some, they're, they're kind of coming out of the shadows. And, and I've heard repeatedly now from several folks that I've talked to that they've received major gifts almost it felt like out of the blue. 
maybe folks who had never supported the organization or who may have supported it many, many, many years ago and were not really even on their radar screen. In addition, uh, those folks who may have some strong inclination to your organization may decide, hey, I need to do more. This, you know, they've made a compelling case, they need my help, and that sense of feeling needed now more than ever uh, may uh, encourage some folks to step up and give. And finally, this segment here is really the one that we want to focus on, where in addition to the capacity and the attachment where we typically would find our major donors living, we now have another reason for them to step up and support our organization. It might seem like a, a bit of a no-brainer, but um, it's important to, to think this through. And I, Kristen, I'm gonna hand it over to you because I know you have some additional thoughts on this. Kristen, you're on mute right now. Thank you. All right. Hoping this works better for you all. Again, my apologies. So as Kim mentioned, there's the attachment and capacity. And some of those questions, I think, are um, especially important to dive into our data to understand um, is how are they connected to you and each other? Um, we know kind of all connections are not created equal. Um, but what are their connection points? Um, I said, how meaningful are those connections? Um, we know a donor with a five-year giving history, a donor with five-year giving history who has volunteered or been a part of different committees and attended a handful of events um, is much more connected um, than someone who has just made those gifts. Uh, what other causes do they care about? I think this is especially important for organizations who are seeking to contextualize the work that they do um, within the challenges of the coronavirus, social justice, or, or other issues that we're wrestling with right now. Um, when we understand the other causes they care about, that can sometimes help um, challenge what I call those major donor self-fulfilling prophecies where a major donor has historically given, um, that's where we often focus and sometimes limit um, our research and conversations with those donors um, to, to the detriment of fully understanding um, what they want to accomplish with their money that is meaningful to them. That's one of my favorite questions as a major gift officer to ask my donors. Um, is what they want to accomplish that's meaningful to them. And that helped both shape the ask and what I invited them to participate in, as well as the language I used around that. Um, and relevant demographic information. Um, this is everything from where they live. We know some regions are hit harder than others, um, both within what we're experiencing 2020 and just as uh, we may be experiencing um, fires in some part of our countries or other disasters, um, what demographic information is important to contextualize um, what they might be experiencing and their comfort level around immediacy and giving. Um, capacity, the wallet share of their giving. Um, I think understanding philanthropic wallet share is a really important um, piece of our major donor research um, sometimes if we don't have that external data, um, we can just write off um, somebody who may have great capacity as, eh, they're just, they're just not that philanthropic. They're just not that generous when um, the reality is we just don't have that highest portion of their wallet share. So, so understanding um, the capacity to give and where we fit within that. Um, how do they prefer to give or transact? Again, this is another great place where we create those self-fulfilling prophecies around, um, you know, they, they don't, they like to sit across the table from us. You know, we, they like the lunch conversation. We have to push that ask until we can meet face to face. Um, or they only give through event sponsorship. 
Um, what are those self-fulfilling prophecies we create? Um, who are those individuals who have previously given to us through donor advised funds? Um, those who transact or make the gift through that channel um, have a greater capacity and comfort level um, with giving right now than those who might give um, outright. Uh, in what industry do they work? Um, I think just about everyone in this country is feeling in some way impacted by the coronavirus. Um, but the way a executive at Zoom um, technology that we're using right now, um, the way they are affected is very different than a um, chief of surgery at a major hospital in New York City or someone who's made their wealth in the hospitality industry in Vegas. Um, so understanding the industry they work in and how they might be impacted is important as we think about both how to approach the conversations and how do we prioritize um, our prospects around some, some, some preliminary assumptions about who might give now. Um, and what is their discretionary spend? I think this is an important distinction, especially right now to understand. Um, net worth, income producing assets, those are all really great data points. I think also understanding discretionary spend and what that looks like right now um, is an important component as we prioritize who can make that gift now. That is such great information. Thank you, Kristen, to really take concepts that we feel like are no brainers, but you just put them in the context of what's going on today to really help all of us really think through. So what next? How do we identify those folks who are going to step up? And, you know, when we know that, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about basically reaching the right people at the right time with the right message and the right ask. And uh, a good way to think about that and, and kind of begin to zero in on who those folks are is to create a segment map. And here is a, an example that I'll talk you through just to help you get the lay of the land a little bit. Uh, here on the uh, going across horizontally, we see capacity ratings from low 25 to 100,000, medium 100 to 500,000, and high, which would in this case be 500,000 and above. Obviously, you would customize this to your organization, but this gives you some framework for how to begin to think about folks. Additionally, as we talked about, this concept of attachment is the other variable that really drives, drives um, major gifts. And in, in this case, we have basically bucketed attachment into three buckets from disconnected, completely disconnected, to disengaged, to those folks who are engaged, very engaged, even what we might call owners, who really are all in for your organization. Typically, those are the folks that you are well aware of. Now, when we think about this, high capacity and high attachment is going to be right up here. These are your best major giving prospects overall. And when we kind of drill into that category, uh, we and put the, and actually access our file and load data into technology that assists us in being able to analyze and understand it, uh, we can take our capacity rating, bar chart here, our attachment group, bar chart here, use some analytics and predictive modeling to weight the various factors that might go into fine tuning someone's attachment with your very specific organization, customizing it, and um, giving you this segment map that becomes interactive with the ability to drill in. And when we do drill in, uh, we begin to learn some things. We can highlight or isolate that specific group of 
major giving prospects, our very best group. And, you know, first of all, we want to see which of those folks are actually staffed. Are they currently assigned to a gift officer who is nurturing a relationship with them or not? And if not, let's drill into that group to better understand what we know about those folks and see if there's information that we have on file that could help us uh, answer that question. So if we use the data and actually some augmented intelligence to give us additional information around that subset of folks, and we're talking in this particular example, which is dummy demo data, uh, just over 600 uh, major gift prospects who are not currently assigned, we can, as Kristen just, just discussed, we have lots of demographic information as a, in addition to psychographic information, giving patterns, as, and even get communication preferences. So imagine if you now can access additional information on these folks to better understand how to communicate with them, what the ask might be to, to better understand even their interest in your specific uh, mission. So things like occupation and, you know, as Kristen already highlighted so well, anybody that's in the hospitality industry, you know, may be struggling right now. They may not be the folks that, that you want to uh, turn to uh, necessarily, but uh, if you have uh, windows into what their uh, current work is, it really helps uh, immensely to begin to zero in on your next best major gift donors in, in a time of crisis. You can also get a feel for their giving affinity and other uh, organizations that they tend to be interested in. And here we just have some examples of charitable, children's organizations, environment, health, international aid, political organizations, religious organizations, veterans. So if you fall into one of those categories, here we go, you can just click a button uh, and, and subset this group of 600 down to a manageable group that has capacity, has attachment, and even has an inclination to support your type of organization. And then finally, to be able to meet them in a way that they are most likely to respond. We've all been uh, on the receiving end of, of phone calls, and we're not phone people. Or we've been guilty of blasting emails to folks who have never responded by email. So when you can get additional intelligence that helps you see that someone is extremely likely to respond to a, a mailing or extremely likely to pick up the phone or not likely to pick up the phone, extremely likely to respond to a digital solicitation or not likely at all you can really begin to now fine tune the ways that you are reaching out to folks with confidence that you're, you've, you've got some additional information that, that allows you to feel good about making an ask. Thanks, Kim. Um, and just to piggyback on a couple other things that you pointed out, I think, again, particularly headed into the fall elections, understanding political affiliation, while it may not necessarily prioritize, for me at least, that was um, always a helpful piece to, to keep in my back mind, to anticipate um, anything that might be a, a hot um, item to, to either avoid or expect a conversation around. Um, one of the questions we got was giving during um, an election year. And at least what we've seen in previous election years, um, and recently it's getting a little more tricky to track simply because people give through different channels and it's a little more challenging um, to identify giving behaviors. Um, giving maintain and in fact increase, the difference is that's often driven through, um, through gifts to a particular candidate. Um, or to a political organization pushing a specific set of agendas. So um, they may not necessarily uh, decrease, and in fact, they often increase their giving, but they shift um, the organizations that they invest in. 
Um, I think, you know, I think like the rest of us, I'm curious to see how 2020 shakes out. Um, so we, I, you know, I'm not sure we can completely bank on giving behaviors looking exactly the same. Um, one of the other questions we got is around how we determine discretionary spend. Um, we leverage a collection of external data points around um, net worth and capacity uh, and, and their spend behaviors to land on that. Um, another question was um, on how we determine philanthropic or what we mean by philanthropic wallet share. Um, philanthropic wallet share simply means um, of all of the um, generosity, of all of the giving a donor may um, spend over the course of a year, how much of that do you secure? So if I give $100 to all nonprofits um, over the course combined over the course of this year, um, what percentage of that generosity um, do you have, have you secured? So it's simply an understanding of the portion of their generosity that you have. Um, so wanted to dig a little bit deeper into putting data into action. And I actually think through this, we may answer a couple other questions that we've received over the course um, of the last hour. One of the things I think is important to think about, and part of why I love um, this tool and my ability to kind of drill down into a little bit deeper understanding around these segments, um, is that your new COVID donors may appear here or re-engagement opportunities. Some of those strategies we talked about where there are major donors that may appear slightly disengaged just because they haven't been a really meaningful part of, of what we've been doing over the last few years. Um, there's some re-engagement opportunities or they might appear slightly less engaged or not a true owner simply because they're newer. Um, so uh, looking at some giving behaviors there, doing a slightly deeper dive to understand how we um, quickly activate and engage um, these segments, those newer donors or the newer opportunities. A couple of you asked about mid-level, and I think this is a key opportunity right now uh, for a couple of reasons. When we have an intentional strategy to engage and interact with our mid-level donors, we know mid-level donors are the most loyal, they retain at the highest level, they are some of our strongest planned gift um, candidates uh, and they are quick transactors. Um, so uh, they are more comfortable making um, increased giving in part um, because those numbers are uh, a bit lower than our major donors, but they're quick transactors at um, a minimum of four figures and often five figure gifts. And finally, um, our sustainer and planned gift opportunities, especially if you are a major gifts program with planned giving expertise, um, where you may have a collection of donors who have said we need to hit pause, or as you create a period of intense cultivation for those major donors um, who may need some slight delays in, um, in being ready to have that conversation for a gift, there's incredible opportunity within the planned gift um, and within this creating a sustainer program. In particular in planned gifts in previous recession, we saw an increase in donors wanting to have those conversations um, in part as a way of fulfilling multi-year pledges or um, continuing support in, in meaningful ways, um, feeling or experiencing the good of what you do or awareness of the importance of what you do. Um, so it's a great opportunity um, to keep in mind our, our planned gift opportunities. So really quick, just in summary, um, identify new or newly prioritized funding opportunities in 2020. Um, define and articulate your 2020 case for support. As I said, it's an important exercise, even if this doesn't translate into um, customized um, shape, shaped and shifted proposals, but understanding um, how you speak into and inform what's happening around this is important for gift officers um, that are having these conversations with donors. 
Um, identify those within your file with the strongest attachment capacity and that new 2020 interest we're calling it. Those, um, um, especially doing a deep dive into those attachment and capacity indicators that are going to impact their 2020 interest and ability to give. And challenge your donor behavior expectations. Again, it's those self-fulfilling prophecies around if I can't visit face to face, I won't give. Um, well, they only like to give this way. So, uh, you know, one of the few silver linings I'm experiencing um, in 2020 is that we are forced to and have the opportunity to challenge um, status quo and to try new things. And we have donors that are generous in the understanding of our humanness and uh, trying these new ways of engaging and interacting with us. Um, and finally, don't forget the long game. Um, building that pipeline of potential future major donors, strengthening your mid-level, and um, paying attention to your planned gifts and sustainer opportunities. Thank you, Kristen. So lots of great information. And as we move into our uh, final few minutes together, I would strongly encourage you to submit some additional questions. We've had great engagement on the Q&A uh, Q box, but please uh, submit your questions now while we have Kristen on the line. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the first in a series of three webinars. Next week, webinar number two will be all about measuring major gift success in 2020 what to measure when you can't visit prospects, a favorite topic of ours. So definitely one not to be missed. Uh, we will send you a link for the registration for the additional webinars with the, a link to the recording uh, after this session so that you'll have everything that you need to review, share with your colleagues and get ready for the next webinars coming up. So we definitely want to keep in touch. And one of the best ways, well, two ways to do that is uh, you see our uh, email addresses here. So if you have questions specifically for either myself or Kristen, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we've also created a landing page, www.continuethedialogue.com. So if there are things that you heard about today, I, I love that summary slide that that Kristen put up. If there are things around identifying uh, prioritized opportunities for this come this 2020 and beyond this fiscal year, I would say, uh, if you're looking for help, better articulating your case for support in a way that um, communicates that you are still relevant today. If you're looking for scoring modeling. Uh, or, or even some strategizing around uh, better understanding your donors. There's so many ways that we can help you. So please don't hesitate to reach out with questions, a need for additional information. Now it's time to get to some of these great questions that are coming in. And Kim, I'll jump in while you're looking for a good one. Just to say, I see a few of you are asking, um, we're happy to send uh, the deck out. I know some of those visuals um, around the different data points that we look at get a little bit fine print uh, on the monitor. So we'll be sharing, we'll, we're happy to uh, make that available. So here's a good question, Kristen. Um, an interesting timing. Uh, Deb Deborah asked, where can I find resources about beginning a major gift program? Oh, especially in a time where existing resources may be realigned, in, in other words, their, her, her organization's resources, rather than hiring new staff. <clears throat> and so the good news is they have a great annual fund program, as well as a mid-level donor program. But they have no one really concentrating on those, you know, upper mid-level donors to take them into the, the major gift uh, category, or even identifying possible major gift donors in their file. Yeah, um, I think it's an excellent question. Of course, as any true cult consultant, my answer starts with it depends. Um, the variables around that, though, are first size of organization budget program. I'm assuming, based on the structure you're describing, you're 
um, a small to mid-sized non nonprofit um, versus a, a large state university, uh, for example. Um, and so I think there's a couple places to start. Um, one, um, in the clients I've been working with, we've had enormous success um, leveraging our leadership and vol leadership volunteers um, to simply steward. Um, their job is not at this point solicitation. Their job is to simply um, steward, thank, and engage um, those top prospects. Um, there are some fairly cost-effective um, analytics tools that will help you pretty quickly focus on who your upgrade opportunities are. I think that's probably a really important place. Even if your donor file is only a few thousand, um, trying to wrap your arm around, arms around multiple Excel spreadsheets, at least that was kind of the, the death of me um, <laughs> when I, I decided I needed to cut bait uh, and find some t technology that could do that for me. I think that's a first start. Um, and then I think understanding, um, again, understanding what those giving handles should look like. And until you really get in the data, um, that may be a tricky piece to understand. Um, and finally, and it's not exciting, um, but it's one of the pieces that I think is so important as you're building a major gifts program is to put thought into the process and structure. One of the worst things you can do is you find that handful of major donors who are willing to really step up the plate and engage. And because we haven't done simple things like process or standard operating procedures, um, we end up uh, offending or somehow turning them off to us as an organization. Um, so again, I'd, I'd love to dive into it. That's one of the pieces I get to do here at Pursuance. So um, we'd be more than happy to schedule a follow-up conversation to just um, dive into that for anyone who's thinking about either standing up or expanding um, their major gifts program. Because it can be a little bit of a, more than a little bit complicated under good times. And this is a little bit unusual right now. And kind of as a follow-on question to that, Ethan asked, what recommendations would you have for organizations that are just starting to build their major gifts portfolios? And let me just take a quick stab at it from, from kind of the perspective of looking at your data, which is where I'm always going to say start first, is go to the data. And so you're going to, I'm not sure, Ethan, what organization you're with or um, you know, well, is, uh, what size file you have, but I would start with what you have. And you're gonna wanna analyze giving. You're gonna wanna basically better understand donor behavior of the donors that are in your file, uh, first and foremost. And then uh, assuming that you have a, a, a sizable enough file to work with, you will secondly wanna work on those two uh, explanatory factors or factors, vari variables that contribute to major giving. One would be capacity, wealth screening, and the second would be making sure that you have some way of measuring attachment. We recommend creating attachment scores, which we do using predictive modeling. There, uh, another way of, of doing that, uh, it would be creating an RFM score yourself using looking at recency, frequency, and uh, previous giving of the individual. So you're going to really want to understand that segment A in the upper right corner of that segment map, because those are going to be your best major gifts portfolios. So I highly recommend taking a stab at creating one of those segment maps, starting with your data. And then at that point, you'll better understand if you're an organization that depends heavily on community engagement. You'll, you're gonna wanna also maybe, maybe better understand who in our community is not in our file that needs to be. Those are a few ideas. Obviously, it depends on the number of gift officers you have. And um, I guess another point I would add is trying to understand the value of those potential major gift officers, that A1 segment so that you're focusing on those with the highest potential value first. Kristen, what do you think? I think that's it's a great. Um, Ethan and anyone else interested, I believe we also, uh, Pursuant has a white paper, a little bit more around portfolio development. So shoot us a note afterwards and we're happy to share that out. Um, if you can't find the link real quick on Pursuant's website. Um, 
I know we're a little bit past time, um, so we'll try to, to reach out. Um, we'll be available uh, if you want to reach out, continue the, the dialogue, as Kim said. Um, as you can tell, we, we love talking this kind of stuff, so um, let's keep the conversation going, and we hope to see you all um, next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. You were amazing. It had a flow. You raised good questions. You kind of like that.